Turn to 2 Corinthians 3, verse 18 uh, this morning. By the way, in introduction, my name is Sean Kisman. And last time I had this opportunity to share God's word with you, uh, I mentioned that I often get confused with Sean Killian. I think we've, we've settled on a way to uh, help those of you who struggle to tell us apart. Uh, Sean Killian is Sean the wiser. And then in the spirit of the holidays, I have become Sean the wider. <laughs> Which uh, brings me to what I'd like to share today. As I considered the setting of this message, it struck me that we have the lure of society during this time to define our goals for the new year, and that often results in a list of resolutions. A new year brings a new hope in accomplishing some of our goals for life. If you have experience at all, any experience at all with, with resolutions, you, can, you could arrive at the same conclusion as me. Many of us have learned that resolutions rarely last, this year, you may have been thinking about resolutions to read your Bible more, to give up a vice like anger or Chick-fil-A. Sorry, Stephen. Or exercise more, or for you men in the audience, to call your moms more. But we don't need resolutions. Not that they are inherently bad. My hope and my prayer, though, is that you, are, uh, that you see something that will far eclipse any resolutions that you have for this year. The heart of this message can be summed up by what the Greeks asked when they arrived in, at Jerusalem right before Jesus Christ was crucified. Sir, we would see Jesus. John 12, 21. Sir, we would see Jesus. And on the precipice of 2024, we need to set our eyes on something that is transformative, that the very looking at brings about a change. Let us see Jesus. Look at verse 18 of 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 3. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord the Spirit. A quick primer on 2 Corinthians. Paul visited the city of Corinth to establish this, this church on his second missionary journey around 52 AD. He wrote a series of letters to them. This letter, which we call 2 Corinthians, is the most biographical of all Paul's writings and the least doctrinal. He reveals much about himself. We read much about Paul's life in this epistle. Yet to, to say that it doesn't re reveal and reaffirm deep theology and doctrine would be a big miss. In our section today, around our, our, our verse today, which, which Wayne read, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and into chapter 4, Paul starts by contrasting the Old Covenant with the New Covenant. And, and he presents a pinnacle in the midst of this section, a Mount Everest of truth. I'm so excited I believe that I could spend the rest of my life trying to climb the summit of this truth. So let's unpack the beauties of this verse, starting with the beginning. But we all, but we all. Paul had just used Moses as a singular example of one who had beheld the glory of the Lord. And now he says, but we all. No longer do we need Moses to go between us and God. Hold your finger or bookmark uh, cha uh, chapter 2 of Corinthians, uh, 2 Corinthians, I'm sorry, chapter 3 of 2 Corinthians, and turn over to Exodus 34. You see, that's what the sons of Israel wanted. They wanted Moses to go between them and God. Exodus 34, starting in verse 34. But whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak with them, he would take off the veil until he came out. And whenever he came out and spoke to the sons of Israel what he had commanded, the sons of Israel would see the face of Moses, that the skin of Moses' face shone. The previous few verses, you see that by the shining of his face, they were terrified. They ran away. They fled from him. And so Moses would replace the veil over his face until he went back in to speak with God again. Moses went in, 
And we contrast that with, but we all. I love someone's title for this verse, verse 15. I'm sorry, verse 18. We all are glow-in-the-dark Christians. We all are glow-in-the-dark Christians. Paul shares that we all experience the same privilege of Moses. Flip over to Hebrews 10. In the Mosaic law, only the, the high priest could enter the Holy of Holies in the temple and then only once a year on the Day of Atonement. Now, with the New Covenant, we read in Hebrews 10, verse 19, Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, this new covenant, which he inaugurated for us through the veil that is his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith, having hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and bodies washed by pure water. Paul reveals a reality to you and me. But we all, but we all. And then he adds, with unveiled face. In regards to the new covenant, Isaiah foretold a time when the veil would be removed, not only from the nation of Israel, but from all nations. Isaiah 25, verses 6 through 7 say, The Lord of hosts will prepare a lavish banquet for all peoples on this mountain, a banquet of aged wine, choice pieces with marrow, and refined aged wine. And on this mountain, he will swallow up the covering which is over all peoples, even the veil which is stretched over all nations with unveiled faces. Unveiled in our verse is in the uh, perfect tense, which pictures a past completed action. It happened uh, in a point in time referring to the day of our salvation, the the moment that we were regenerated and been given the, uh, the gift of faith. That is what Paul is referring in in just two verses prior to our passage today in 2 Corinthians 3.16. But whenever a person turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Why? Well, for sure, so that we could see, but there's an element that we'll explore further in this verse of an effect that God has when he removes the veil makes me think of the benediction in Numbers 6, verse 22. Numbers 6, 22 says, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron and to his sons, saying, Thus shall you bless the sons of Israel. You shall say to them, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. God, God's face absolutely shines. His countenance absolutely is lifted up to us when the veil is removed. When the veil is taken away, we have unveiled, face, unveiled faces, and our verse today says we are beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord. Beholding. Not a word I use in my vocabulary every day. Uh, It's a somewhat synonymous word with uh, the word seeing, but with a special emphasis. The root of the word means to look intently. Now, I'm not the brightest bulb in the four-pack, but I'm pretty sure that you can't look at something intently when you have a veil over your face. So the veil is removed just as when Moses would go to talk face-to-face with God. So we can behold so we can look intently. What's more, the Greek word Paul is inspired by God to use means to gaze intently into a mirror. I think uh, the ESV, the English Standard Version, Bible translators omitted this line, into a mirror, and I understand why, but the Greek word has the root word mirror in it, so I think it's, it's something that we can explore. If you're familiar at all with mirrors of this time, they're nothing like the mirrors that we have today. It was actually polished metal. And two observations related to the mirrors of the time. First, 
you had to hold it closely to see what you would see. Turn to Hebrews 4, Hebrews chapter 4, 4. You had to hold it closely to see what you would see. There is a proximity involved. And I think this is demonstrated by what we see in Moses' account. He was face to face with God, as Exodus 34 described. We are even implored to not only be in close proximity to God, but to be in his very presence. Hebrews 4, verse 16, Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. There's a needed proximity in the use of it. And the second observation, you saw imperfectly what you were trying to see. Turn over to 1 Corinthians verse, uh, chapter 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. You saw imperfectly what you were trying to see. And I believe that's true of us this side of uh, glory. 1 Corinthians 13, often thought of as the love chapter. We're going to start in, in verse 12. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I will know fully just as I, as I, as I also have been fully known. I long to see uh, clearly. I long to see fully. But yet what I see now, what I see now is, is a cause for great joy in my life, for great peace in my life, for great love in my life, and great hope in my life. The beholding in our passage is in the present tense. It's happening continually with continuous results. And what are we beholding? What are we seeing intensely, closely? The glory of the Lord. Turned it back to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. In verse 4, we'll read there. But before, I want to give you the academics. The academics would say that, quote, the glory of God is the magnificence, worth, loveliness and grandeur of his many perfections which he displays in his creative and redemptive acts in order to make his glory known to those in his presence. And this definition of glory, this definition of the glory of God is the, is the finite trying to define the infinite. It, we just can never do it justice. But Paul, Paul gives a relative demonstration of what that glory is, the glory of the Lord, in just a few verses after our passage. In verse 6 of chapter 4, 2 Corinthians 4, 6, For God, who said, Light shall shine out of darkness, is the one who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. Tie this with John chapter 1, verse 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. The glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. If you wish to see the glory of God, look to Jesus. Look to Jesus. Philippians 2, verse 9 says, For this reason also, Christ's condescension, condescension from heaven down into, into, uh, into earth, God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The Bible, the Bible takes us from garden to garden, restoring our fall from the garden where everything was good and right and perfect to a garden where the tree of life produces fruit for us monthly. But in our definition of glory, God displays his creative and his redemptive acts for a purpose. The gardens are just a, a means to an end. 
It's not about us. It's not about mankind. It's about the glory of the Lord. God's word reveals and puts on display Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Savior, our King, our High Priest, our Mediator, to the glory of God the Father. As the hymn says, Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. We need this. We need this for his glory, for our good. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. And that beholding, that beholding does something to us, doesn't it? We are being transformed into the same image. Transform, metamorphosis, a change in form. Our our transformation is actually a paradox of of the, the then and the now and the not yet. It happened at a point of time when we were born again. John 3, when when Jesus was talking to Nicodemus, Jesus answered and said to him in verse 3, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. The regeneration of the Spirit in John chapter 3 was a past act for us. Turn to 1 John chapter 3. So we go from John chapter 3 to 1 John chapter 3. We have been transformed, and yet we will see we will be transformed in the future. Amen? 1 John 3, verse 2. Beloved, now we are children of God. Amen. And it has not yet appeared as yet what we will be. We know that when he appears, we will be like him because we will see him just as he is. A future transformation, a hope that we have, a future assurance that we will be like him. And presently, in our passage today, it speaks of our continual, ongoing transformation, or what we call progressive sanctification, progressively being set apart for holy use. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in in the mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed. Ken quoted, and I remember where I was sitting when he quoted it to me. Ken quoted John Newton to me once. I identify progressive sanctification in my life in much the same way this dear saint recorded. In his old age, when he could no longer see to read, John Newton heard someone else recite this text. By the grace of God, I am what I am. 1 Corinthians 15.10 John Newton remained silent a short time, and then, as if speaking to himself, he said, I am not what I ought to be. Oh, how imperfect and deficient. I am not what I wish to be. I abhor that which is evil. I would cleave to that that which is good. I am not what I hope to be. Soon, soon I shall put off mortality, and with mortality, all sin and imperfection though I am not what I ought to be, what I wish to be, and what I hope to be. Yet I can truly say I am not what I once was, a slave to sin and Satan. I can heartily join with the apostle acknowledge by the grace of God, I am what I am. I am not what I ought to be, what I wish to be, what I hope to be but I am not what I once was. I I was transformed. I am being transformed. And I will be transformed. Flip over to to Romans 8 now, and we'll take a look at the, the chain of grace, the golden chain of grace, all by grace. Grace, grace, God's grace. He is transforming us into the same image that we are beholding. Romans 8, verse 29. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. 
This conforming is, is being pressed into his image. 1 John 2.6 says, The one who says he abides in him ought to himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. We, we start to mimic what we behold. We want to become more and more like him. And it says, from glory to glory. The, the ESV translation says the change is from one degree of glory to another. Turn to Philippians chapter 3. The, the ESV translation of our verse accurately speaks of a gradual, a progressive process, and it's not just an instant change or a, a, or a future glory. In this life, it is a journey from glory to glory. Paul lived this journey as we see in Philippians chapter 3, verse 14. Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward calling of God in Christ Jesus. I press on. I press on. It is a progressive process of being made holy as he is made holy. And our verse continues, from glory to glory, just as from the Lord the Spirit. I'm so excited for our Sunday school topic this session, which is the Trinity. In a, in a month or so, we're planning on spending several or multiple sessions on looking at the Lord, the Spirit. The, the, the work of the Spirit is transformative in our lives. In Scripture, we see that through His power, the Spirit's power, we are convicted of God's Word. We see where we are saved by the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Spirit. We see He is the means of our lifelong sanctification. And we see His fruit is manifested in us in love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. Bryn, help me out here. Goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. All nine of them. Wow. And here in our passage... Paul emphasizes that through the new covenant, we are given the spirit of the Lord. Through the spirit, the Lord, the spirit, which is what transforms us into what? The glory of God, the image of Christ. So we can understand what the words say. What do they mean? I think the meaning is, in, is, is simple, incredibly simple, in fact. And yet the meaning is profound, incredibly profound, in fact. Beholding is transforming. One action begets another action. Beholding is transforming. We would see Jesus. Beholding is transforming. I heard a method of emphasis that says to repeat something three times in the vein of uh, 2 Corinthians 3.17, which says where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. We're going to try something new. It's, if it's a bust, it's okay. Ken will be preaching next week and he can pick up the pieces. I want you to say this with me. Beholding is transforming three times. Ready? Beholding is transforming. Beholding is is transforming. One more time. Beholding is transforming. It is impossible to overemphasize this principle. Some of you may be saying, uh-oh, Sean the Whiter is charismatic. I think that's okay. This is not a new church practice, okay? It's just a method of emphasis. And it's a method or it's the answer to how to live a Christian life. Beholding is transforming. This reality is, is better than any resolution. In fact, it is the solution to every aspect of our lives. It is the answer to how to live a Christian life. But you don't understand the pulls of this world, Sean the Whiter. I do. I'm far too acquainted with the cares of the world. 
There was a message written by a man named Thomas Chalmers in 1819 entitled, The Expulsive Power of a New Affection. Chalmers was addressing 1 John 2.15, which reads, Do not love the world, nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. I may do it injustice to boil it down into a few sentences, but the premise is so appropriate to the meaning of our verse today. Chalmers asserts that the heart must have an affection. It's like a a glass that we either fill with the love of the world or with a new heart we fill with the love of God. The love of the world is displaced, uprooted, put out by beholding our Lord and Savior, and that beholding swells a love for him, and that love drives us to obey him. Do you struggle with lust? More of him. Do you struggle with anger or despair or hopelessness? More of him. Do you struggle in your marriage, in your work, in your family, in your walk as a Christian? More of him. We don't address lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life with law. We address it with a love for him. We don't address hopelessness, despair, depression that can lead to suicide with pills. We address it with love for him. We don't address our progressive sanctification by focusing on resolutions to read more or pray more or serve more. Those are manifestations, that those are the result of a growing love for what Doubting Thomas said, my Lord and my God. Simple, yet profound. Beholding his glory is transforming us into the same image from glory to glory through the Lord, the Spirit. How do we behold? How do we behold? This is simply an overview. This is not exhaustive in quantity or quality. In fact, each one of these could be its own message. But this is what I know from Scripture, and I know experientially as well. We behold him in his word. This one seems obvious. As we discussed earlier, the purpose of God's word is to reveal himself to us through the person and work of Jesus Christ. We see that accomplished even in our verse today. Let me share with you what Warren Wearsby said about this verse. He summed it up by saying that when the people of God look into the word of God and see the glory of God, the spirit of God transforms them to be like the son of God. Let me say that one more time. When the people of God look into the word of God and see the glory of God, the spirit of God transforms them to be like the son of God in his word. We behold him in prayer. In the Lord's prayer, we see praise and thanksgiving and supplication and confession all while coming before the throne of the almighty God, the supreme, the magnificent, the sovereign creator and sustainer of all. And it begins with our Father. We behold him in worship. I want you to know how precious it is to me to participate on Sundays in worship with you through the singing of praises to our almighty God. Turn to Romans 12. Um, To be honest, I have to tell you, I feel cheated sometimes when I'm distracted or, or detained from worshiping him with you guys. When I miss even one stanza of a song, I miss an opportunity to behold him. But worshiping God doesn't stop with Thomas's last strum of the guitar or the last note of the piano. 
Romans 12, verse 1. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. We worship him in everything we do. There's not any aspect of my life that isn't an opportunity to worship God from working, eating, driving, resting, playing. Every moment I can worship him because my life can be a life of worship. Work in the light of God as our great master. Eat in the light of God as our great provider. Drive in the light of God as love and worship him. And by worshiping him, we are truly beholding him. We behold him in fellowship. Turn to Hebrews chapter 10. I don't have time to, to go through all the, the proofs of this. I love Ephesians chapter 4 that shows us that our fellowship in the body of Christ is to grow up in all aspects into him who is, who, who is the head, Jesus Christ. But what's more here in Hebrews 10, we see something happen when we assemble. Hebrews 10 verses 24 through 25. And let us consider how to stimulate. That means to poke, to prod, to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day draw near. We stimulate and encourage one another to love what we behold and that results in what? Good deeds. And we behold him in service to him. In service to him. I see God in the examples you set for me in service to him. Meals, community groups, prayer lists, nursery workers, deacons, audiovisual team, worship team, greeters, back office, building, cleaning, and maintenance, moving ministry, helping hands, missions, evangelisms, women's and women, uh, men's ministry. I can't, I can't even name all the services. It's just t- the tip of the iceberg of how you serve him. I don't see it all. Praying for one another. Sacrifice of time and money for one another. Your very lives. It glorifies God. Turn to John 13. As you're turning in there, I have an announcement, a side note. Uh, if you are not beholding our Lord as you serve, this is the perfect time to hop in and serve. If you need ideas of where to serve, check with Wayne Embry or myself, and we'll help try to find you a spot to serve. In John 13, verse 35, Jesus says, By this all men will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Christ is set on display by your love for one another. No pressure. Don't mess up. But even our acts of service are are a result of something. Our service reminds us of who we are and more importantly, who he is. It's the manifestation that we are, as James says, a slave a, a bondservant, a slave of God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Do you struggle? Do you struggle to behold him? If you struggle in your daily walk with our God, are you beholding him? Are you using the means that he's given us to behold him? I'm amazed at how in my own life, when I have the cares of the world washing over me or the love of the world tempting me, how I do not behold them in word, in prayer, in worship, in fellowship, in service. It's a manifestation of my lack of trust in him, really. I don't see him so I don't trust him. 
But when I do see him, I see that he is sovereign. Nothing in my life is not divinely under his rule. When I do see him, I see that he is wise. Even the trials that he brings into my life are for, are for the purification or the proving of my faith. And he does it perfectly. When I do see him, I see that he is good. Not like an imperf- imperfect father like me, but a perfect father that loves his children, children whereby we cry, Abba, Father, Abba, Father. Simple, profound. Beholding is transforming. Not like an imperfect, I'm sorry. He has given me uh, so many ways to behold him. The whole earth is what? Filled with his glory. Filled with his glory. Turn to Isaiah 40. Turn to Isaiah 40. There may be someone who says, but I don't see God. This is absolutely true. If you don't know God, you certainly can't behold him. The darkness of sin veils your eyes. God removes the veil when we, when we repent. Remember when we read in 2 Corinthians 3.16, but whenever a person turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. How do you turn to the Lord? His word says, if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. If you are saying you can't be whole because you don't believe, may today be the day of your salvation. The mess, this message in Isaiah is what we all with one accord proclaim today. Isaiah 40 verse 9. Go up, on a, uh, up to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good news. That's the gospel. Herald of good news. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem. Herald of good news. Lift it up. Fear not. Say to the cities of Judah, Behold our God. Behold our God. Behold our God. Pray. Pray that God would remove the veil from your eyes so that you may behold Jesus Christ, Emmanuel, with us. We just spent an entire season commemorating that, dwelling on that, filling our minds with that. We even had a banner, which I'm sad they took down, that said that, Emmanuel, God with us. Repent and believe. (laughs) To conclude, Jesus cannot be the central part of our life if he is not the central part of our vision. Ask most grooms, there's been a few of them recently, ask most grooms, and they they will agree, you set your eyes on what you love. And you love what you set your eyes on. We would see Jesus. Today we stand at the beginning of a new year. As we contemplate this, contemplate this next year, let us encourage one another. We have time. Let's turn there to Hebrews 12, verse 2. Let us encourage one another. Seeing we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, Let us be fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. You want a resolution for this year? Fix your eyes upon Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Beholding is transforming. Beholding is transforming. Beholding is transforming. Bow your heads with me. Lord, you know the prayer recorded a long time ago by Richard of Chester. 
Thanks be to thee, my Lord Jesus Christ, for all the benefits thou hast given me, for all the pains and insults thou hast borne for me, O most re merciful Redeemer, friend, and brother. May I know thee more clearly, love thee more dearly, and follow thee more nearly day by day. Lord, give us these three things, I pray, to know thee more clearly, to love thee more dearly, to follow thee more nearly, not just this day, between every day, between now and glory. May, may our eyes be set upon Christ as we see him, as we behold him. May, may our affection, our love for him be stirred up. And as, as our affection and our love is stirred up for him, may we be about your business. May we be filled with, with the desire to obey your commands. We know that the promise of your word says that if we delight in you, you will give us the desires of our heart. And we pray that you would give us more of you, that we would behold you more, that that would consume us. I do not know what this, month, what this day, week, month, or coming year holds. For some of us, it could be great joy, the birth of a child, the marriage of someone, a blessing upon blessing. And for some of us, it beholds a trial that, that drives us to our very knees to cry, Abba, Father. I just pray during these times, whatever you have in store for us, perfectly, sovereignly, divinely, may you help us to see Christ as altogether lovely and worthy of all glory and honor and praise and dominion forever and ever. Our hope and our prayer, dear God, is that all things would work for your good, I'm sorry, for your glory and for our good, so that the name that is above all names would be exalted, Jesus Christ, in whom we pray. Amen.